Welcome to the podcast, everybody. My guest today is Trey Harris, the Florida Atlantic Division Manager with the Cutco Vector Marketing Business, headquartered headquartered in Orlando. Trey's been in the company since 1999. He started with the legend, Larry Manley. And uh, Trey was going to school at East Carolina. He graduated, became a district manager with the company in 2004. And Trey has been one of the all-time great district managers in the history of our company, culminating with being number one in the company, winning the Silver Cup in 2016 as a district manager. At that point, he was promoted to take over the Florida Atlantic Division. And Trey has been one of the most prolific developers of talent in the history of the Cutco Vector business. He has promoted 53 branch managers and 19 district managers during his illustrious career. He's responsible for over $35 million in business. So of course, a member of the Cutco Vector Hall of Fame. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while, Trey. Welcome to the podcast and thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. All right. Well, let's hear about when you first started with Cutco back in 1999. Take us back. Yeah. So prior to Cutco, I had the, the normal jobs and, um, you know, as a teenage boy, it was kind of maybe not doing all the right things that I should have been doing. And I got a letter in the mail. So I am the vector mailer. So it does work, everybody. And open it up. $10.25 was the base pay back then. Super pumped. Came in for my interview, got accepted and uh, came home. Parents were pretty supportive. Mom was for sure very supportive. Dad a little on the fence. Um, did my first demo with them. And, and then that was pretty much lights out after that. So that's it's how I cool. heard about the job. It's cool that your parents were supportive, Trey. Well, uh, not everybody is. What made your parents uh, excited that this would be a good job for you? More mom, more mom than dad. Uh, but she was, she was always the encouraging cheerleader. You know, she was really the, the mom that said, put your mind to it and you can do it. You know, you can do anything. And you know, she really coached me almost as much as Larry, you know, every day when I came home, she was like, what did this lady buy? What did this lady buy? You know, what did the lady from church get? What did this one get? Um, you know, and if I ever had a rough day, she's like, it's all right. You know, tomorrow will be better. You know, she was very, very supportive, very encouraging more than, more than most for sure. That's incredible. I wish everybody could have that kind of environment when they start this job, because it makes a huge difference. You know, my mom kind of laughed at me when I came home from the interview and, you know, just didn't think I could do something like this. I don't think my parents were negative about the job. They were sort of neutral, but they just didn't think I could do it. Right. right? It wasn't that the job was bad. It was like, well, how could you do this? Right. You're shy. You don't talk to people like, you know, that's kind of how I was back then. And um, and so I certainly didn't have that sort of vibe when I came home after a tough day. Um but, uh, but my mom at least loved the product and, and I, I could see right away that I was going to be able to sell because, you know, she was a, right in our target market and, and she really liked it. I knew that other people would too. Yeah, for sure. My dad was lieutenant colonel in the army. So when he found out that we own K-Bar, you know, he was on board on right then. <laughs> and, and I'm with you hundred percent. It's unfortunate that people don't have, you know, super supportive parents, you know, especially in time they start something new, but I think that it's not even just Cutco. I think it's that any time that someone goes against the grain and wants to do something that's not quote unquote normal, that everyone's going to, you know, I don't know if you can do that. Maybe you should just do what's normal and regular. And then, you know, how do people supposed to get ahead in life if they just do what's normal and regular? Yeah, exactly. A lot of times uh, the people in our life want to protect us from, you know, harm as they see it. Um, but I've learned that the, the walls that keep out the difficult stuff also keep out a lot of the good stuff and that, uh, you got to give people a chance to, uh, you know, get in there and take some risks and experience some failure. And that's how success is ultimately achieved by most people. So it's cool. Tell us about some of your experiences on the job, Trey. Well, I mean, as a sales rep, you know, basically was just pretty average, you know, I sold about eight out of 10, you know, probably $300 average order back then. But I think the difference is that I outworked people. Um, I was never afraid to roll up my sleeves and grind. And I think that that's a really important skill for anyone to have. You know, I don't think that selling cutco really is about talent as much as it is grit and 
and, and making sure you're getting the job done. So worked hard as a rep. I was really good at recommendations. You know, I crushed recommendations. And you know, I think that that's a, a really important part of really this business and any business, you know, whether it's realtor or anything in sales. I mean, it's, you got to have a lot of people to see. And, and we, you know, I think it's super important to put a lot of emphasis on getting a lot of recommendations. So I think those would be the main things, you know, as a rep, you know, my keys to success and, you know, open communication with Larry, right? I think that a lot of times people may be afraid to talk to their managers. And, and again, whether it's Cutco or any job, right? People just are afraid to tell the people exactly how they feel. Larry and I always had a very open relationship. I could tell him when I'm happy, when I'm sad, when I'm angry, when I'm pumped up, whatever, and just tell him exactly how I'm feeling. And he could always coach me through it. I think that's super important, whether it's business or any relationship, just say exactly how you feel and people know where you are and then they can help you along the way. So Larry's a fantastic coach, you know, really took me under his wings. Uh, and as an assistant manager, you know, I started to actually get to work side by side with him and hear him, right? I think that there's only so much that people can learn reading something in a book, right? It's You got to be in an environment where you can actually implement stuff. And, you know, just working side by side with them, specifically coaching calls, you know, just how he works with his reps. I just got to absorb it and learn it and ask questions. And, you know, then eventually I became a branch manager. And... I was scared to branch. I, I really was. I wouldn't have admitted it back then as a 20 year old, but I was really nervous to, to quote unquote, take the leap. And, uh, but it was, it was literally my favorite summer that I ever had, you know, as a 20 year old kid, we recruited 119 people and, you know, sold over hundred grand in Fayetteville, North Carolina back in uh, 2002. And it was my favorite summer. And the, one of the reasons, that I really wanted to go district. What's funny is that the reason I was, I was scared to branch is because it was all on me. Right. But then that later that, that summer, my dad who worked at Wachovia, which now as well as Fargo, they merged together. He had worked with them for, I don't even know, 30 years, something like that. And literally just one day they just out of the, let's say there's 200 people in his office, 197 just got fired, you know, just out of nowhere. My dad, luckily, was one of the three that got to keep the job. But the point is, it's, you know, I just think about corporate America and how it's about the bottom line and making sure the shareholders are making money and maybe not always in the best interest of the workers. And what's funny is that that's the reason why I went DM is because I had more confidence in myself than I did in, you know, other companies doing what's supposed to be right for me. Yeah. Wow. That was really interesting what you said that one of the reasons you were scared to branch was because it was all on you. But then later, one of the reasons why you wanted to be a DM was because it was all on you, right? You were fully responsible. It wasn't up to somebody else. If you, you know, kept your, your uh, job, it was up to you and your results and your effort. You know, if you did well advanced and earned more and more along the way. It's an interesting flip that happened in your mindset throughout those years. Yes. Yeah. What do you think uh, were some of the contributing factors to your great success as a district manager? You know, I was thinking about that one and I would say caring about people is ultimately the most important one. I think that as a, as a new district, and as a new business owner, again, regardless of the industry, people are, are fighting their fight a lot of the times when they're opening up a business and trying to be probable and make sure they can pay their employees and, and, and live and food, right? And I mean, it's a part of a struggling, you know, getting a business off the ground in the first place. But when I started off, you know, when I was fighting that fight to get out of paycheck to paycheck, new business owner, I found myself, and it's sad to say it out loud, but just being completely real, right? Like wanting people to sell mainly so I could make more money and make the business and pay my bills, right? Mm -hmm. And then this is before campaign bonus. This is before a quantum bonus. This is before pace. This is before any of these things that now is in existence for DMs. But 
and that we had just came out with a, a campaign bonus or a quantum bonus or something. I know I got a $10,000 check, right? And it was like, okay, I don't have to worry anymore. You know, I can, I'm fine. And then I focused on my people more than I cared. I cared about them more than I cared about myself. And then magically we ended up selling more, right? So I think caring about your people, um, being comfortable with who you are, which I'll talk about later when we talk about development, but being comfortable with who you are and realizing, you know, I'm not Larry Manley, you know, I never will be, I'm not Matt King, you know, but uh, you can learn from all of the people that you grow up in the business with, take the traits, be comfortable with who you are and own it yourself. Uh, Jake Bailey was a, an, an old district manager and I was so, he really opened up my eyes a lot because I was so scripted, you know, here's the script for the interview, here's the script for the training, and I just like followed the program, right? And I saw him run an interview, or, or no, his training, it was a back on DVDs, and, you know, I saw his training, and it was just completely Jake Bailey, you know, not a script, and it really just opened my eyes that I don't, I, I, just, I just need to understand what is the objective that I'm trying to accomplish, and, and then run with it, and be my, my, my own person. I think that was a, a really, 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 really big, big one. And then, you know, that was Matt King, you know, always, you know, he, he really impacted me. I was a sales manager in 2003 before I graduated college. And then, you know, got to move down to Florida and work with him and, you know, be the ADVM with him. But, you know, growth, 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 growth. You know, we read books, you know, and I didn't always necessarily want to read the books, but I was really glad that I did when I got done. Right. And, you know, it was always about growth, you know, constant never ending improvement, you know, always challenging yourself. How can I get better? How can I get better? Instead of just, you know, eventually you get to a point where you're doing well and it's like I could coast, but what's the, the one thing that makes you want to be great? And I think that if everyone found that, you know, it would be a very different world that we live in. Hmm. Great stuff that you just shared right there. Um, I like the the point you shared, which you, you learned from watching Jake Bailey, which is about just being yourself. And I think what's key for people is to understand why we do what we do, right? Whether you're in Vector or outside of Vector, there are programs you follow, there are things you say, there are methods that you use, there are strategies. And instead of just hearing from somebody to do this and then, you know, doing it, really digging in to understand why we do things a certain way. Why do we say this at this point? Um, why do we handle this sort of situation in this manner? Um, and when you understand the why, you can bring your own strategies, your own ways of being to that, um, which, you know, will come across as much more natural and I think uh, will be received a whole lot better than just trying to copy other people and, and how they operate. That was a really good insight that you shared right there for sure. Yep, what is the objective? What am I trying to accomplish? What is the desired outcome? And how can I be genuine to get that point across? Super key. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the fact that you worked very, very closely with Larry Manley and then very, very closely with Matt King. I mean, these are two of the all time legends in the history of Cutco that you had a chance to observe and learn from. Um, it's so powerful that you had that influence in your early career. Very fortunate, very fortunate. And it was really great to be able to learn from two, you know, um, you know, Larry, the, the family, the caring, you know, um, the, the coaching, right. And then Matt, the raw, let's be great. Let's make sure we're always growing champion mindset. Right. Cause I mean, what you grow up seeing is just what you think it is normal. I remember as a branch Larry used to always just something small, right. But team night out after the, the team meetings on Wednesday night, he would always pay for all the appetizers, right. For the whole team. I thought that's what you're supposed to do. So as a branch, I paid for all of the appetizers every, I spent probably <laughs> a couple grand on apps over the course of the summer. I, again, this was before I saw Jake Bailey and really understood like, okay, you know, um, and so I was just copying what Larry did. Right. And then I'm 
you know, Matt sales manager, I'm like, you're not buying apps. He's like, no, I'm not buying everybody's appetizers. Right? <laughs> um, and I'm like, oh, maybe the, I don't have to just do the way I saw it the first time. So it's really great to learn from two separate people, regardless of whatever the industry is. I think that if everyone had the opportunity to coach with two, I think it would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good stuff right there. So you are a district manager from the middle of 2004 after you graduated all the way through the end of 2016. So 12 plus years, 12 and a half years as a district manager. Um, and during that time, you became known as one of the most prolific developers in the company. Um, every year, basically since your early career, you've averaged over four new managers per year. Some years it was five or six, maybe even a few years more than that. Um, but every year was over four new managers, uh, you know, among branches and new DMs, which is really incredible. Um, what makes that happen for you? Yeah, specifically development or just in general success as a district manager? Yeah, let's specifically talk about the development side and what you feel like created those results. Okay, so for development, you know, just a few development tips I would say is the first is, you know, making sure that you're having fun and that you love your job, right? Think about how many people actually love their job. Uh, very few, you know, I'm sure less than 5% of society really wakes up and loves their job. And it's just promoting what you love about your job. If you promote it enough, then other people are going to want it. You know, so do we wake up excited, right? And are we passionate about what we're building for the day? Or do we just show up like employees and oh, I have to run this interview and oh, I have to do this and I have to do that. So, you know, promoting how much you love your job. You know, um, the next thing was that I jotted down was being, being the same person on the inside as you project to be on the outside. And I think that that's a really big one. You know, how do you present yourself on the outside? And then as, see, as you develop people, obviously they're getting closer and closer. You're letting them in closer into your circle. And if what they see as they get closer is that you're not the same person that they saw, you know, what you promoted on the outside, well, then it's the, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. And it's like, who is this person? And now it causes me not to trust you or want to follow you. So <clears throat> just be a, a genuinely good person, be the same as you project on the outside. And I think that's going to help out a lot. Take an interest, take an interest in their, their life outside of the business. You know, what percent of the conversations are on the business and what percent are outside. And, and I don't think it needs to be, you know, a big swing, but <clears throat> at least at the beginning of each conversation, talking about their, 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 outside of the business interests. You know, do we know their girlfriend's name? Do we know what their major is? Do we know why they're here? Do we know what they want? You know, just really taking interest in them. Larry taught me a long time ago, the love is spelled T-I-M-E, right? And it's spending time with your people and getting time with them. And, and how important is that now with Zoom, with this virtual world that we're in, right? They, they don't ever get that. So I think it's super important to have you know, at least once a month, a staff night out, right? Um, I think that it's important to take people out to breakfast or brunch or lunch, right? But really getting time with them uh, outside of the business, but with mystique, right? Because I think that that's another thing with a lot of district managers being younger, and you know, maybe they are a little bit rowdy, you know? Um, I, I would just kind of say to myself, would I do it in front of my children? Right. Or if I'm in my 20s, would I do it in front of my little sister? If no, then I probably wouldn't do it in front of the reps. Um, so making sure that you have mystique, um, you know, lifestyle. Are you showing off your lifestyle? And, you know, it's funny is like I don't really do it with social media a lot. I feel like everyone posts this, you know, let me just take a picture of the nicest dinner I ate this week or something, you know. Um, and I feel like people project a, a life that's not necessarily 100%. But letting showing off your lifestyle, right? Um, letting them, you know, invite them over to the house, invite them over to whatever, you know, talk about the things that you do outside of work, right? Especially when you're at the beginning stages and, and then grind mode. Um, one other thing that I wanted to share was 
<clears throat> making a list. So I remember Larry was always blown away. I would always have the depth chart and I would have a list of all of my favorite people, like my top reps. And then, you know, where they're at in career sales, how much do they have? And, you know, uh, withholdings, you know, their savings account, how much money do they have? Where do I see them the following year, the next year, the next year, the next year, I would have a four year plan, right? And what's funny is that I would sit down and do the, the four year vision casting and Jeff's quoted it now as cut, go through college. It sounds way better, right? Cut, go through college plan. But, you know, make a four-year visionary plan with them. And, and I would take them to lunch. We would write it out. And then it's crazy how many of them kept that paper. And when they go district, they're like, by the way, I still kept this paper. You know, I branch, you know, this summer I was the two-time branch here. I went district here. Just making that plan and see it forces us as business owners to have the vision and create the excitement about what we're building, who's gonna play what kind of roles. And if I'm gonna get them at that point soon, well, what are the things I need to do to develop them to get them there um, and right now? you know. So I think that, that right there is super important. Uh, I wrote protecting family time. All right, I think that's super important. Why did I want to go district? Because I wanted Larry Manley's life, right? Great family life, you know, I wanted that. So it's important to protect that family time because if you, as a business owner, if you allow people to take your time outside of work at certain, if you don't set boundaries, then people are going to call you all the time. So protect the family time and, you know, really just challenging champions and then encouraging discouraged. And it's, we all know that saying, you know, challenge the champions, encourage the discouraged, but, you know, do it, you know, are we really thinking about that when they call after their no sale or their ultimate? You know, we, you know, when they had their tough day or their great day, you know, challenge champions. There is so much that you just shared right there that is incredibly powerful. Like that little short segment was, was just a master class on how you take somebody who's, you know, up and coming in the business and you turn them into a future vector manager and leader in this company for the long term. Um, so much good stuff. Starting with the idea of um, having fun and loving your job, right? I would encourage everybody who's listening, who's a district manager, and I hope every district manager in the company listens to this because that was so good. How are you exhibiting that you enjoy what you do? How are you conveying to people that you're having fun with your work, that you really love working here, that you really value working here. Um, I think that comes through people seeing you like just actually having fun and doing fun things. I also think it comes from people, from people seeing you talking about the impact of the job and how, how rewarding the job is to you for more than just income, but you know the, the feeling of impacting lives that we have here uh, in Vector. Like that's a big part of the promotion that, hey, I'm doing something really good. This is a great place to work. That is key. Um, the showing of your lifestyle, right, to, to others. And, and, and I, would, I would just, I would take the word off out of there. It's not really showing off your lifestyle. It's showing your lifestyle, right? It's showing what, what it is that you do. What, what do you do when you're not at work? What are the things you do with your family? Um, you know, what, what is the job provided for you in terms of being able to have more choices and options, um, in life? These are all things that people want, right? They're all working so that they can have a certain lifestyle and they want to see that, you know, Vector has created that for you. Um, that to me was really powerful. Um, the, the in-person influence piece that you shared, right? This is something, Trey, that I think is so critical now that our company has pivoted to a largely virtual model. I don't think there's a single one of us who's leading in this company who would say we'd be here today if we never met our manager for a year, if we never spent time in person with our manager. Um, a big part of what makes this business successful is the relationships that are built, 
right? Maybe a lot of people have heard the expression that, you know, it's easy to quit a job, but it's harder to quit a friendship, right? Or quit a relationship. And we build relationships in Vector. And I'm not saying we can't do that over Zoom. I'm just saying it needs to be, a, a segment of it needs to be in person for sure. Um, where we're spending time with our staff or we're spending time with our key people um, and it's in person, right? And whatever interval makes sense, whether it's once a month, some of you might feel like, maybe it's once a week, others might feel like, but that element of in-person time is such a powerful key to building the kind of relationships that are gonna keep people here for the long-term. How are you doing that these days? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked. We, I think it's real important that for assistant managers and our top RAs that they come to the office on Sunday. That's the one day that they come together. Now they're all, you know, got their social distancing going on. There's like seven on staff that live in Orlando and then, you know, one, you know, somewhere out of town and just working remotely. But, you know, they're, they're together on Sunday. You know, when we are developing the next layer of people, that's one of the first things that we'll do is we'll invite them where they can come in on a Sunday, right? Then they get to actually see everyone and see that we're actually real people and they get tied in, they love each other and, you know, it helps, it helps with the next layer of development. So we do that, that in the office once a week, that's the one time that they they see each other there. If they would like to show up at another time, they could, but we're not really there a ton anyways. And then with our actual assistant managers, we do a, a, a once a month, we'll do a staff night out. And it's, we have a monthly goal. And if we hit this number, I pay for hundred percent. If we hit, don't hit it, then, you know, I pay for half. And we just go out and, and hang out like this coming Saturday, you know, I'm getting a hotel uh, at the beach and, you know, we're just gonna have a good pool day, beach day, and, you know, just hang out, you know, and not talk about work, right? I think that's important too, because vector people will come so close where a lot of us are best friends, right? And it's, you know, when we're hanging out, I'm hanging out. If I'm working, I'm working, right? Uh, and, I, and I try not to really intertwine those when we're on our chill days. So once a month staff, and then once a week, they come into the office on Sunday. Yeah, that's great. So there's a weekly, you know, working time, but there's also a monthly just fun hangout, right? No, no work needs to be done time. Um, you also described Trey keeping a list of your people and mm -hmm. then you do the napkin talk That's right. with everybody, right? You do the napkin talk where you sit them down and you, you paint the vision right, of where they could be, um, of why it would be exciting. Um, this is so critical. Like you're, you're leveraging your personal power to get people to be interested in being here and doing this. Um, they're, they're hearing competing uh, influences all the time, whether it's a friend who's saying, Hey, you know, let's go this direction in life, or what are you going to do? Or it's parents trying to influence them for sure. Society's influencing them constantly. Right. And, and I think that most people take the path of least resistance, whatever seems like it's the easiest way to go is where they end up going. And we want to help them see that vector should be their path, right? It doesn't right. just happen naturally. We can't expect people to just naturally, you know, like being here and then want to just keep being here, right? There has to be a leader that says, hey, this is what I see for you. This is what I believe you could do. This is why it would be great. Here's what the future could look like. And you're doing all of those things combined from showing that you like what you do, displaying the kind of lifestyle people would want, spending time in person to influence them, taking interest in people, and then painting this vision. It's, it's an amazing formula for success uh, that I think anybody could emulate. I agree. If, if we're not influencing them, someone else is. That's for sure. Probably not in, in the best way. And, you know, the easy way is never the right way. So, and, and, and as the, our job as the leaders is to provide that vision without vision, the people perish. You know, if, if I keep doing the same thing over and over and I don't think that there's a, an advancement path or somewhere that's going to eventually I'll get bored of it, right? So what's the next challenge, right? How, how are we going to get them? And that's our job, right? Is to provide that vision. Yeah, uh, that was really, really powerful. Um, I'd like you to speak to, you know, the current district managers in Vector for a moment here, Trey, because you were a district manager for 12 plus years 
And there's a lot of young, uh, great district managers in our company who aspire to be a division manager one day. And in some cases, that opportunity opens up quickly. Um, in other cases, you know, somebody's going to be a district manager for five years, 10 years, maybe even more as they're pursuing their greater path uh, in vector. Um, and I, I think you would be the perfect person to share with people why building a powerful district is amazing in and of itself. Even if someone never became a division manager, why is the district manager role so awesome? What would you say to some of our best young DMs about uh, about that? Yeah, I'd first let's start with appreciation, right? And being appreciative of the opportunity that we've been given, right? I mean, as, as we're evolving, you know, we are, I mean, we have people who want to be district managers and we don't have territories for them, right? So we, everyone that is a current district manager, you have the territory, you have the opportunity, what are we going to do with it, right? Um, are we going to appreciate it? Or is it like, oh, I've arrived, I'm now a district manager, I got the title? Or is it, hey, I'm a young business owner, and I want to grow this thing, and I want to put my name on the map, right? So I would, I would say the appreciation, you know, there's no limit, right? And, and, and I know people talk about that, you know, there's no limit, you know, you, you sell more knives, they'll pay you more money, right? But most people are capped, right? You are not capped as a district manager, you can have endless branch managers. You can have endless district managers. You can develop your CSPs. And I always hear people, you know, oh, I want to have all these different income streams. Well, you, you can do that as a district. It's called uh, new business, CSPs and FSMs, branches, districts. You can have an amazing, amazing lifestyle as a district. I love being a district manager. My wife and I, we, well, we built our first house at like 26, maybe, 25, maybe. That was awesome. We got to pick out the lot, literally build the house from the ground up and pick out literally every single thing. As a 20, we'll call it 26 year old. Who does that? Right. That was awesome. And then, you know, the, the lifestyle, if, because as a division manager, you know, you got to deal, you know, you're going to manage all of the other district offices as a district manager, really, you're just managing your office and getting calls with some of your branches, but it's easier to shift the dynamics. It's like a speedboat turning, right? Or, you know, a jet ski, if you will, versus a big, you know, big old tanker, right? It's, it's, it's easy. You can change it fast. Um, so there, you're not limited. You can make a ton of cash. You know, I think that my last year as a district manager, it was around profit after all of the expenses, you know, around 180 to 200 grand. And that was after all of the things that were, you know, meals and, and everything that we could write off. So you can make a lot of money. And, you know, the other thing as a district manager that, cause see, it's sometimes hard for people to realize what they're doing financially. What I always told myself as a district is that the normal person doesn't save anything. And anyone that's really good at saving usually saves 10%. So if I could just tuck away 20 grand for that year, well, then that's the equivalency of a normal quote unquote person making 200 grand. See, a, a lot of times, you know, as a district, I think that people roll in their personal expenses and their business expenses and are, you know, combining it. No, if, if you worked at any normal salary job, it's you make this and then your personal bills are this. What do you have left over? Right. Um, and here you have chances to save hunks of money. Right. Your uh, campaign bonuses. What if you just saved your campaign bonuses each campaign? What if you saved 100% of your development bonus? What if you saved your super bonus every three years? What does that look like? And then you get your money making you money. So uh, the district manager opportunity, and by the way, now better than ever, better than ever. So the difference, the whole thing has changed back in the day, right? People didn't get fired as a DM. They just quit because they couldn't perform and because they weren't making enough money to stay open. Only the successful people made it, right? And now with all of these bonuses, everything, the bills are less than they've ever been. Someone could be subpar and still turn profits. So right now, if you're kicking butt, your expenses are lower than they've ever been before. Your profitability is high as it's ever been before. There's never been a better time to be a district manager, literally, than right now. Yeah, so with, with everything that has changed in the business in the last few years in terms of the increased revenues and decreased expenses, 
it's a whole different ball game to be able to earn the superior levels of income that you talked about. How much did your office sell in 2016? Your last two, year as a DM? Two, over 2 million. Your, your oh, last no, year. no, no, I'm sorry. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It was probably like 1.6, 1 1.7, somewhere around there. I didn't, it wasn't 2 million. It was 1.7. 1. Right. 1. 1.7 million and you had deployment as well. And that earned you 180, 200 grand, something like that. I've got a guy in the Western region in 2020 named Kuval Patel, whose office sold 1.2 million for the year um, and had a little bit of deployment as well. Uh, probably not as much as you have had on an annual basis, but had good deployment, 1.2 million and netted somewhere in the 180, 200 range because of how the model has changed. It doesn't take the same amount of volume to be able to earn 200 grand. And if you're earning 200 grand net as a young business person, like that literally puts you in the top 3% of all Americans, um, of all humans. Um, you're in the top 3%, maybe the top 2% at that income level. Like that is an amazing opportunity that is at your fingertips. And Kuval did that in his third year as a district manager. Um, and so that is at the, the, the fingertips of anybody listening. And of course, that provides a lot of choices, that provides a lot of lifestyle, all those things. Um, and I think that uh, there's a lot more to it than just the income, of course, but that's a lot of the things that like, your young entrepreneurs are looking at initially. And district manager is the gateway, right? To everything that you might want someday. So pretty amazing to think about. Now, over time, Trey, in addition to being great at earning, I know that you are always really good at saving and investing. Um, I have heard uh, about you that you have de you know, developed a tremendous level of financial success. You were a millionaire as a district manager. Um, what were some of your, or what are some of your uh, most important financial habits? Yeah, I would say, I would say several things. The first thing that I just want people to think about is most people go to work to make money. Now I get, and, and, and Vector, it's, it's also that we get to impact people. We feel good, you know, leave a, a legacy, right? But normal, like most people work 40 plus hours a week, but then they put, why? To make money. But then they don't ever even take time to learn about money and how to make the money work for, for them. And then that's why they keep in the same patterns, right? So I think that if you think, if, if we view it from the, how many hours a week do I work? Uh, if, if I am working to make money, then how many hours should I be putting to making sure I'm doing wise things with the money? People need to read more books is where I'm going with that. So I think that it makes sense to read books. I think it makes sense to get in good habits instead of, oh, I got a big paycheck. Let me treat myself. You know, I think there needs to be checkpoints. And, you know, one thing, you know, for if anyone's taking notes on it, I would say start with the end in mind, right? When do I want to retire? What age? Where? How much is everything going to cost? How much is the dream house? Do I want a boat? What, do I want to pay for kids college? Do I want, what do I want? How much does all that cost? And then how old are you now? And then work it backwards to how much do you need to save each year with, you know, we'll just call it a conservative 9%, you know, interest rate. How much do I need to save each year? And see, then we don't get the, the king of the hill. You know, I, I've got, I've saved this much money and I'm, I'm happy now I'm going to go spend it. It's like, well, I'm still not exactly where I need to be for the year. You know, let me hit this number and then I'll treat myself to this thing over here. So I think good financial habits, having a budget and see budgets just aren't sexy. No one wants to talk about a budget. No one wants to talk about a budget, right? But you have to have one. I mean, you make this much, what's your budget? And then you can save this. So people need to have budgets. Every grown adult should have a budget. Um, three quotes, getting three quotes on everything. Anytime I get stuff done, whether it's, you know, anything on the home, right. Or even Hudson just started karate literally, uh, two weeks ago. And, you know, that's this little karate school and, you know, they're showing me the packages of what it's going to be, you know, per year, crazy expensive, by the way. 
And, you know, so I go and I look at three other quotes. I want to get, you know, I have them. So I wanted to get two other quotes. I found another school that has an equally high ranking and, you know, faith-based and it's, you know, a nonprofit and it's like half the price, you know? So whether it's karate classes for a kid or redoing a pool, right? It's get three quotes so you can make sure that you're, you're getting a good deal. Um, you're never becoming complacent, right? I think it's very easy to be complacent. Most people have a number they feel comfortable with. And when they pass it, then they spend. And if they're ever below that number, they're like, oh, let me work harder and, you know, get back to where I feel comfortable. And that's why they always stay where they are. So having those checkpoints, never becoming complacent. The other thing was tithing. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, I never really gave 10% uh, until maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago is when I actually really got into tithing. But it's just crazy when you give money away, how you're not like a slave to money. You view money very, very differently now. And I think that's what the whole purpose of it was from the beginning. But doing good things with your money, giving it away so you don't feel like you're a slave to it. And, you know, those would be my biggest takeaways. But I, th I think one of the biggest ones is, you know, really starting with that end in mind and having those checkpoints and working them backwards. Most people... I don't think most people know what they want. And then, then they're kind of like on this hamster wheel where you keep running, but you're in the same place. We don't even know the destination. And it's like, if you're, you're trying to go somewhere in your phone, it's where you're here. I want to go here. And it gives you the turns. A lot of people don't even know what the destination is. So they're just showing up to work to showing up. Yeah. You know, the, the end in mind concept is really critical. And, you know, for somebody to understand to understand the process to get to that end, uh, it's important to be educated as to how your investments compound and how the growth curve becomes steeper and steeper and steeper the farther along you go. So, for example, if you want to be able to retire in forty years and you want to have four million dollars accumulated when you retire, it doesn't mean you have to be at a million in ten years. It, it it's not even anywhere near that. Um, it's probably more like 200,000 in 10 years and you're on track to get to 4 million in, in 40. Um, and so it takes a much smaller amount than you might think in the, in the short term to be able to get to what you want in the long term. As long as you start now and you're consistent year in and year out. So developing that understanding, have somebody, have, having somebody help you calculate and paint that picture for you whether it's a financial advisor or, or a friend that understands it, a mentor that understands it, reading, studying, getting into good habits financially, as you shared, is really key. Um, I like that point about get three quotes, right? Anytime something's going to be expensive, obviously, right? Um, making sure that you're getting the right deal on it and that you're, you're not just acting too fast. Um, I did the exact same thing just now, right? I've been, we've been considering a, a home improvement project um, here at our house. And we just got three quotes and they were widely divergent. Like the highest one was more than 50% higher than the lowest one. 60% um, higher, I want to say, than the lowest one. And so, you know, we don't want to end up paying double for something that you don't need to, to, you know, pay double for. And I can remember when we first moved in, we did some, just some basic paving of a patio and we had bids anywhere from 14,000 to like 32,000 for the exact same job. Right. Um, so that was really good. And then, uh, Trey, I love what you said about charity. Right. And, uh, I, I just think it's good for people when you find a cause you want to give something to, and you just try to think about what amount do I want to give, give, give the amount that might even make you feel a little uncomfortable to give. And the more that you do that, the more you realize, um, that you aren't a slave to your, to money, and that you can impact people in, in ways that are bigger than you might think. And that's just one, one example of how you can do that. Um, Prey, you mentioned earlier protecting your family time. And I think that'll be a, a great uh, last topic for us to talk about here is, you know, how do you balance everything? I know that uh, you, you and your wife, Meredith, have two young children. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the role that your family plays in your life and how you balance it all. And it's, it's the most important. It's why it gives, it really gives purpose when you have children and you just want to be a, a good influence for them and a good leader for the family, for, for my wife, for my children, for, you know, the habits that I want them 
to instill, you know, along their life. And, and it's hard. It really is hard. And people don't talk about it enough. Obviously we're in the front row dads group and, and there we can actually, I mean, it's a great group. I'm glad it was created, but it's hard, man. Um, you know, before, before kids, you know, it's like, okay, come home, relax. Right. And now it's, you know, okay, get the kids ready for school, take the kids to school, come back, grind. You got to get everything done by 445, you know, go get the kids. Right. Then it's okay. Let's, let's get homework done. Let's feed them, bathe them, read them a story, get them to bed. Right. And then you have this much time, right. To, uh, spend with the wife until boom, pass out and, and make it happen. So, you know, being intentional and getting all the things done when we need to, I think that, you know, what's really key is, is we have family night on Friday night. This is what I thought was really cool is, is I kind of sat down and thought, what does the perfect family life look like? And Friday night, we have no TVs, no tablets, just family night. And we'll play board games. We'll do whatever. And it's just family time every Friday night and, and no interruptions. I love that. I love making sure that we eat dinner at the dinner table. And, you know, usually without the TV on is what we're striving for. We can, we can always do better with that one for sure. Um, but, you know, just get in that quality time in together. Um, with balancing everything, having a planner, you know, using the planner, really doing a power hour. And, you know, what's great is that my wife is very organized, you know, and so we all sit down every month or so and just go review the whole family calendar, you know, so she's got stuff that I wasn't aware of. I have stuff that she wasn't aware of and just making sure we're on the same page with everything because, you know, I think that that's a reason why people have arguments is that, you know, they're just not clearly communicating and on the same page. So Meredith and I don't review in calendars, family nights, uh, one-on-one time, I think is super key. So, you know, I, I like to take Hudson golfing at least, at least two or three times a month, you know, where it's just him and I having boys time, you know, being outside, you know, we do the hunting camps, right? Again, daddy days. I love daddy days. Brenly's too young right now. She was, you know, one and a half. So, so like watch Coco Melon and, you know, it's about, it, you know, taking them to the park. All right. And see, that's also, is, is, I was reflecting on the year, like my favorite things. A lot of them actually don't even cost money. Right. Taking the kids to the park and just hanging out. Right. Um, and then talking to Meredith about, you know, what, what does she really want and trying my best to provide that, you know, I, I was taking the kids on date night, you know, we'd go out to dinner and I took the kids and I thought I was doing a good job. And then, come to find out she's like but that's not a date if you have kids i'm like oh okay so let me go to babysitter right and <laughs> making sure that, that we're having our date nights right because at the end of the day it's easy to lose sight once you start adding kids to the mix right but she was there first right so we got to make sure that we're putting her at the top of the priority level and the family time and it's easy to forget you have to plan it or it won't happen so i think those would be some of my tips on on family balancing with family. Amazing stuff, Trey. Really, really, really good. Um, I'd like to ask you here as we wrap this up, you know, the theme of the podcast is changing lives. And as you look into your future, Trey, uh, how do you aspire to change people's lives through your work or through your influence? Well, I think becoming more and more educated and involved with my faith uh, through small groups and impacting people there. Um, obviously, a lot of it comes through Cutco. I mean, we, I mean, straight up, we get, we have a lot of influence and we get to impact a lot of lives. And, you know, it's eventually when we die, you're either a debit, all of us, we were either a debit or a credit to society. Either we took and took and took and just give me, give me, right? Or give, 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 give. And, and, what are you, are you plus, what are your plus or minus at the end? Uh, I think about, you know, the, the things that we learn are not normal. You know, that's why I love this, this podcast and, and having the top people to share their thoughts for everyone and, and outside of, of the Cutco business, but you know, with the wheel of life, are we helping our people through finances, personal growth, health, family, spiritual relationships, social contributions, career, um, you know, we get an opportunity to do a lot of good and 
you know, specifically with Cutco, I feel like the age of 18 to 22 is when people are really figuring out who they are, what am I, what, what am I about? And the decisions they make during that four years, in my opinion, is going to dramatically 100% determine the trajectory of their life and where they go. And we get the power to influence that special time. And so we want to make sure that we're, we don't take that for granted and that we show up the right way and um, honor, honor what we do. So amazing, Trey. This has been from start to finish really awesome. Um, I feel like uh, anybody, obviously, if anybody's a district manager, they could get incredible value from this, even if somebody is not a Cutco Vector district manager, to think about um, the, the insights for building an organization, for building a team, um, to, to be able to get good at painting a vision, uh, taking an interest in people, the care that you described, that paradigm shift, that mindset flip uh, that you talked about earlier, um, spending time with people, um, making sure that you have the right financial habits, and then of course, purpose and intentionality with your family, first, because that's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, this has been a masterclass for success in business and in life. I really appreciate all your preparation and uh, everything you brought, all the value you brought to this. It was a great credit for sure uh, to the podcast to be able to have you here today, Trey. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for having me, Dan. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that was awesome. Trey Harris, such great information. Um, at the beginning, he talked about having open communication with his mentor, Larry Manley. And it just got me thinking about Larry and thinking about how do we create a vibe where people are willing to be open with us, right? Through our listening skills, through the coaching we provide, the feedback we give, how we respond to anything they bring to us. Um, Larry is so good at those things. And Trey was really lucky to work with a guy like Larry. I thought that was pretty cool. Of course, Larry has been featured on the podcast. Make sure you check that out. I love the mindset flip that Trey had from, man, I was afraid to branch because it was all on me to, I love being a district manager because it's all on me. And that feeling of control uh, that we have when we're responsible for our results and our results are responsible for our rewards. Um, we being in control there provides the ultimate uh, self-confidence that you can have if you, if you are a self-confident person, believe in yourself to be able to perform. Uh, Trey gave away some great ideas on how to develop people in your organization, whether you're a vector manager or somewhere else. That section was awesome. Of course, he talked about getting in good habits financially because part of the reason why we do what we do is to be able to build a nice lifestyle and having good financial habits provides us not just that opportunity now, but also to sustain and build that opportunity for the future. And then of course, purpose and intentionality with your family um, being the, the priority uh, above all else as you are pursuing all of these other goals and other insights. Trey asked a great question toward the end where he said, are you a debit or a credit to society? Or when you look back on your life, were you a debit or a credit to society? And I just want to take that question one step further to say, what about today, right? How did you add value to society today? If you can think about adding value to society every day, adding value to the people around you every day, you will get um, much of the things that you want in your life that will circle back to you and help you create a life of great influence, great success, and great fulfillment, much as Trey Harris has and is continuing to create in his life. Thanks for listening today, everyone.